everybody. Welcome to Generative Art SVG in Celestine. Uh, before we start, if you'd like to follow along with any code examples, uh, get a raw copy of the slides, uh, as well as play with your own Celestine sandbox, you can do that in github.com uh, slash redcode final slash raw crystal 2020 talk. Um, just as well, too, if you'd like to play around with the um, Celestine docs and learn more about how Celestine works, you can go to docs.celestine.dev and that'll set you up with everything you need to know. All right, so uh, I'm Ian. I'm a web developer at my own company uh, that does web development solving. Uh, I'm a generative artist. I really like crafting pretty pictures, especially ones that are dynamic and have anim animation in them. I'm a security dabbler, so I really enjoy uh, playing around with Chinese net cams because they're just very insecure and usually very poorly programmed. Oops. And I am the Celestine author, which we're going to be talking about today. So before we start, who, who is this talk for? Uh, anyone who's really interested in making art, if you think you're going to be good or bad, you know, generative art, in my opinion, is kind of like the great equalizer. You don't have to be good at drawing. You, the only thing you really have to do is have some imagination and the ability to program. Uh, anybody who's a web developer will gain something out of this because we're going to be talking about SVG and the SVG format can actually do a whole lot of things, um, which makes it very useful for web developers who um, maybe, you know, aren't as happy with dealing with CSS uh, animations. Uh, plotters, charters, and visualizers, anybody who's working with big or small data of any kind, uh, SVG has a lot of cool features in it that can make it possible to um, uh, visualize your data in new and exciting ways. And anybody who really enjoys just taking an idea and turn it into a product and getting that sense of accomplishment, um, you'll hopefully enjoy what we're going to do today. All right. So uh, what you should know, you're going to need at least a basic knowledge of Crystal. If you're a Rubyist coming in, don't worry. There's nothing I'm going to cover that is outside the realm that Crystal and Ruby share together. Uh, you're also going to need basic Kamal. Um, which is our version of Sinatra, very simple, just get root kind of stuff, and very basic HTML and SVG. You won't need to know Kamal or HTML or SVG if you just use the GitHub project that I, I made. It includes a sandbox that's already set up for you. So before we uh, jump into the generative art part of it, let's talk about SVG and what it can do, um, because it's kind of a standard that is a little bit, um, I don't know, muddled, I guess, in what it can really do. Uh, it, first of all, it, it allows you to draw really simple shapes, essentially, to a canvas using XML tags. So you use stuff like path and circle and rectangle. And uh, all of that contributes to your overall picture on your canvas. Um, but the thing is that SVG can actually do a lot more than just draw a couple pretty pictures. And it turns out that SVG can make very complicated animations. In fact, when I started this, I thought it was really could only be used to make incredibly simple animations. But by the time I was done with it, I found out that there's stuff that you can do with the animations in SVG that um, is comparable to the kind of stuff you could do with JavaScript. Uh, you can also use really incredibly strong filters with uh, SVG. It rasterizes whatever vector stuff you have and applies a filter to it. And at first, again, I thought these, the filters were incredibly simple. But as I started to learn more about it, I learned that there are some really strong ways you can mix them to make very interesting effects. And uh, anybody who um, is a uh, uh, who wants to put CSS or JS into the SVG document, you can do that. So, for example, if you're doing a um, a website, right, and you have a light mode and a dark mode, well, you can structure your SVG so that way, when you swap between light and dark mode, it uses the same CSS colors. And there you go. You've got um, you know, some basic interactivity in that. You can also hide JavaScript in it. So it's very interactive. Uh oh, there we go. All right, and you can do all that too with Celestine. It's a really simple SVG library for Crystal. It's, uh, I wrote it as a domain specific language. So it's fairly simple. You start off with the Celestine, oops, Celestine draw method that takes a block that takes a context. And that context has very simple things that can get run on it, rectangle, circle, you can group items together, all of that jazz. And the thing is, is I also built all the filtering and masking and animation stuff that's in SVG into Celestine. So it should be fairly easy to pick up and use. So let's talk about generative art. Generative art refers to art that in whole or in part has been created with the use of an autonomous system. So I've got this uh, picture right over here. Uh, this is called MindShift. It's on my website if you want to see a live version of it. But uh, the uh, Crystal and Celestine both work together to make this image and animate it and put all the features into it. 
And the thing about it is that each time you run this program with a different seed, a different number to input it uh, or to input with, it will change the entire layout of the picture. You know, it'll still look very similar to this, but instead, you know, maybe it'll have different colors. The bridges will be in different places. The, the windows will be in different places. There's uh, a lot that you can do with generative art in terms of just randomization and, and making interesting stuff. All right, so let's talk about some generative art techniques. And a big one is random numbers. Uh, pretty much that's like the backbone, I would say, of most generative art is random numbers. And uh, there's three different types that essentially are most used in uh, generative art. There's PRNG, which, stand, which stands for pseudo random number generator. And it generates a random number with an even distribution. So you're just as likely if you're asking for a number between one and 100 to get one as you are to get 10. Um, but what's cool about it is you can seed it to re-roll the same random values. So if you liked the rolls that you got, uh, you can just remember the seed and you'll get those same rolls as long as you use them in the same order. Normal distribution uh, works similar to PRNG, except instead of being even, it just uh, focuses essentially and tries to hit close to the zero mark. It, you know, it, it'll deviate. But for the most part, it's going it, to, you know, it's, you're very likely to get a number between 0 and 0.5 versus getting a number like 3, which is, you know, really out there on the chart. There's also Perlin noise, which is what we're going to be using. And the reason why um, Perlin noise is so useful is that it's a lot more iterative um, or iterable than PRNG is. And to explain the problem, if you use PRNG to generate a piece of art, right? And if there's any chance that um, the PRNG isn't asked for values in the same order, or it uses values out of order, you'll end up with an entirely different picture, even though you used uh, the same seed. So um, Perlin noise makes that a lot easier because it just uses coordinates and we can iterate through coordinates a lot easier. But what it does is it returns a value from float max to float min, uh, and it tries to steer between the values. So it, it interpolates between the noise and We'll, uh, we'll look at what this actually looks like here in a second. Uh, this is the Perlin noise shard I wrote. Um, it's fairly simple. It's probably a little busted in some ways, but for the most part, it's going to work for what we're going to do. Uh, so we'll break it down here. First of all, there's the dot noise function. That's uh, what we just talked about, float min to float max. It tries to keep it around negative one to one, but I think there's some instances where it can go out of bounds. There's also normalized noise, which just takes noise but it um, compacts it into a space between zero and one, which can make things a little more useful for us in certain aspects. Um, there's also two sibling methods that you can use off of this, int and item. Int lets you choose a number between a min and a max, and it uh, chooses that number based on the Perlin height. So if you use normalized noise at the zero coordinate, right, and you get 0.5 out of it, you're going to get 50 if you ask for the same um, coordinate using int with a min max of zero to 100. Uh, there's also item, which lets you pull an item out in the same way. So again, it's tied directly to the Perlin height. But sometimes you don't want things tied to the Perlin height. It might not be exactly what you want. So you might actually want an even distribution of numbers, but you still might want to use the coordinates from Perlin noise. Uh, that's why I wrote these PRNG methods. Essentially, what it does is it takes the coordinate and it plugs the value that's at, in it into a PRNG. And when it does this, it seeds the PRNG, and then it rolls one number, and it's done. And so this gets you a fairly random number every time, you because you just increase the seed by one, and you're pretty much set. Um, you can also use it with item as well, so you can pull a random item out of a, an array. And uh, there is one issue, though, with doing this method, and that is that all the values, if you use them on the same iteration, are all tied together. So an example bug would be like you build a building generator, right? And the generator generates a building color and a building height. Well, you find out that all the buildings that are three high are all red and all the buildings that are four high are all green. And you're like, why is this happening? It's because you accidentally tied all your values together. So to fix that, I added a secondary seed system, which just moves the uh, coordinate point that it's at and just moves it just slightly over. So it just gets just a tiny bit different uh, of a number and it generates, of course, a much more random even distribution that way. All right, so let's talk about the process or how to you know, make some art. And so I, I broke down a, uh, a more simpler version of MindShift because if I had done the original version, we were gonna be here all day talking about that bridge, how I did those bridges. But uh, 
this is this is fair, um, fairly simple, and it also let me use a couple features that I didn't get to use in the original one. So let's jump on into it. Um, so the setup was I was on Reddit, and I, I'm going to say this right now: look for to Reddit and open processing and all these other kind of art sites for inspiration because there's a lot to be taken from what other people have done. Just truth be told. And I was on Reddit and I saw this picture and I was like, I love this. Everything like there's there's just so much I like about it. I like the depth of it. I like the colors. I like how it's simple, but yet, um, you know, I can like look at it and I can identify uh, the different steps I could take to make this a piece of generative art. You know, I can use Pearl and Noise to make these little chasms and um, I can use PRNG to choose where the windows go and stuff like that. So um, the other the other half of it, too, is I was while I was on Reddit, I saw in the comments, somebody had said, you know, this picture is super cool. But the issue is that it it would be way cooler if it was animated. And I was like, I can I built animation to Celestine. I can do that. So the first setup I do is I make some color palettes. And the way to do this is you don't have to know any color theory. Go online and check out this site called coolers.co. It is a really simple site that just generates color schemes for you. Like it doesn't get really any simpler than that. Um, the second thing I want to do is I want to set up my secondary seeds in advance because I know I'm going to need them. So I just put some values, you know, um, for what I'm going to need for later, and I'll just use them as we go. So uh, first step one, we want to choose this color scheme, right? Because uh, that's probably the first thing we're going to want to do. And to do that, all we use is just PRNG item to pull a color out of or a color palette out of our colors array, and we pop in the seeds for the for the colors, and you just fill a giant rectangle with that color, easy peasy. Uh, not not too difficult so far. The next thing we want to do is make what's called what I call the chasm mask. And uh, to kind of explain how masking works, when you apply a mask to something, if the mask itself has white elements on it, whatever is um, you're applying the mask to on those white elements shows through. But if there's black on the in the mask, it will basically punch a hole through whatever you're masking, so you can see the stuff below it. So we're going to start by making a bunch of black rectangles, and we're going to align them all pretty much in the center, and we're going to give them random widths, right? Then we want to apply a Perlin, the Perlin noise function to it, so it makes it nice and wavy. But unfortunately, when we do this, it's going to kind of look unnatural. So to fix that, we apply a little x-axis deviation, and that, uh, what's it called? Um, that jitters it a little bit to make it look nicer. Uh, then all we need to do is just apply it as a mask. Uh, here we have the code to actually make the mask. You know, you make the stuff that you want to show through white and the stuff you don't want to show through black. And then you just use Celestine to set the mask and easy peasy, not too hard. Um, so right now, though, I, looking at this, I'm like, this is not really where I want to be. This is like like the most basic idea of what I want, but there's still a lot of refinement that needs to be done. And unfortunately, I can't really go too in depth on how to do that kind of refinement. It's really more just about visually playing around with the values and finding what works for you. Um, you know, like some of the challenges I had was stuff like I tried to use uh, a single formula to describe all the levels. And the problem is, is that it wasn't producing the values I wanted. So to make things a little simpler, I, um, I made it so that way uh, each layer has its own data essentially on how big the rectangle should be to, to make the chasm mask. Um, how big uh, or how, how far you should you deviate with the pearl and noise and stuff like that. And we just make sure that the chasm gets smaller um, as we go further back so we can see the stuff at the back, if that makes sense. So next we want to animate it. And this is really easy using Celestine. You just use the animate motion method on any drawable that you want to animate. And what we're going to do is we're going to draw a path, okay, using very simple turtle commands. And it's going to start in the upper um, left hand corner, and it's going to go up to the negative screen height. And this moves our layer up, right? But when we do this, there's going to be a seam on the bottom that's going to show. And then eventually the layer is going to get entirely out of frame and then it's going to snap back. So to make this um, more seamless, what we're going to do is we're going to take an exact copy of the layer and we're going to put it down below it on the y axis. So as the layer comes up, it's got this other layer behind it. And then when the animation ends, it snaps back and the user doesn't even see that there was a seam or an animation change. And uh, you just make the duration of the animation longer the farther you go back. So that creates that parallax scrolling effect, like you're going down the chasm. 
Uh, this is the code to do it. Fairly simple, run dot animate motion on it. Um, tie the tie the level to the duration so it makes a uh, it makes it longer the farther back it is, and then um, just draw your path and draw your copy underneath it, and there you go, easy peasy. So the last thing we're going to do is filters, and uh, for this I really wanted to create a depth of field kind of uh, effect, and how that works is that this whatever you're focusing on is going to be not blurry, but then whatever um is closer or farther away from the point you're focusing on is going to be blurry so in this case i want to focus all the way back to the last layer and all you do is you just define a filter for each layer using the uh, blur filter in svg and you just make the blur amount more the closer you are and you got easy peasy dof um, this is all the code that's necessary to do it you pop in some filters uh, make four four filters essentially change the deviation to be exactly tied to the level and then just set the filter and you're done. There you go. Um, here's a couple just examples with some different color palettes. Hopefully the blur kind of comes through. It might not come through as great in the, the Zoom call, but uh, it's there, I promise you. And yeah, that's it. That's all I got. So if you liked what, what I had to say today, check out my GitHub at github.com uh, slash redcodefinal. If you're interested in doing some business with me or buying some art or something, hit me up at Ian at Solvin. Um, however, if you want to email me about your crystal project, I would love to hear it and I'd love to network with you. So email me about your thing at ian at 0x4242442242.in. And also Celestine is at github.com slash Celestine CR slash Celestine and the docs. And that's it. So let's jump into the Q&A here. Oh, All right. thank you very much, Ian. Pause here. Let's see. Pause here. There we go. Is anyone... I don't, I don't see anything in Q&A, but maybe oh. in the chat you can drop. Yeah, some. let me check. Yeah, let me check Discord real quick. I didn't. I didn't hop into that yet. Oh, here we go. Uh, nope, it doesn't look like there's any. Uh, what's it called? It doesn't look like there's any Q&A. So I think we're all set. Oh, never mind. Hold on. Uh, can you tell me something about how your crystal code maps to raw SVG, particularly animation stuff? Yeah. OK, so this is this is fairly simple. Um, let me actually share my screen again here. OK. Um, oops. All right, let's go to sol.vin here real quick. I'm just going to open one up. Um, yes, you can do bitmap effects with Celestine anonymous attendee. Uh, okay, let me just go inspect element here. I'm just gonna go grab the image. Here we go. Control C. Oops. All right. Um, so this is a uh, <laughs> this is the breakdown of of what one of these files actually looks like, and um. The animation part of it, let's see if I can find it. I think it's all the way at the bottom here. The animation part of it is going to be right around here. Here we go. So how it works is it just wraps. Um, you just wrap whatever uh, thing you want to animate inside tags. Um, so for example, here we're going we're gonna to animate a group. Um, and we just use the animate motion. It includes a path, et cetera. And it pretty much maps fairly straightforward to how um, how you would write it in Crystal, I guess, if that makes any sense. Uh, let's see. How did I get into interactive art? Um, I was really bored. <laughs> I think it's the best way to describe it. I was really bored, and I really like open processing. And I was like, I want to do open processing sometimes. So I started playing around with that, and I got kind of into it. And then I got to a point where I was like, I don't really like the language processing um, is here? built upon. So I'd much rather. Uh, yeah, sorry. Can you hear me? Oh, sorry. What's up? Yep. We are seeing your presentation. We're... Oh, you're still seeing my presentation? Oh, I'm sorry about that. What the heck? Why did it you share? Hold on. I don't know why it did that. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. There we go. Um, so here, this is the uh this is the breakdown of how it looks. This is the animate motion. Sorry, I guess I didn't I didn't do that right. But um you just wrap your whatever item you want to move um in or uh you, you mat wrap the animate motion tag in whatever item you want to move and it will handle it for the most part. Um, is it possible to embed Celestine rendered output in a larger HTML page using something like ECR? Absolutely, yes. You just uh, you just use uh, Celestine.draw like how you normally would. You can also um, use Celestine.draw with an IO. So if you have 
some sort of an IO system that you're using to build your rendered HTML output. It's just as easy as using the IO in draw. But yeah, I think that about covers it. Any more questions? Anybody got any more stuff? All right, cool. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for listening. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Kevin, Kevin asked, uh, how did you get into interactive art? Oh, oh yeah, I thought I, I thought I answered that. I said that um, I uh, I really what what happened was I was really bored and I just started like looking around on the internet for like programming projects that might interest me. And I ended up coming across open processing and I played around with processing.js a bit, but I don't like JavaScript very much to be honest. So I uh, you know wanted to use stuff that you could do in processing in Crystal, but there wasn't really a good method to do that. So I ended up kind of jumping into the SVG format for it. All right, great. So oh, there's one more. Oh, one more question. Let's see, Q and yeah, here we go. Um, do you recommend any mathematical areas that'd be helpful for doing interactive art? Um, yeah, uh, I would say there's there's a couple um, big things that you know are really common in generative art, and one of them is fractals. Fractals are probably like the like most interesting thing in uh, generative art. There's just so much you can do with them, and there's um, they're just really just intensely interesting because they just go on forever pretty much. Um, let's see, what else? Flow fields are another good one too. A lot of people do a lot of generative art stuff with flow fields. Uh, Perlin noise is another excellent place to start if you um, you know, want to learn how it actually works because I'll tell you, I don't. <laughs> I don't know. I wrote the gem and or I wrote the, the shard and I just translated it from somebody's Ruby code. So I couldn't tell you how Perlin noise really works on a real level. All okay. right. I think we're all set. Okay. Hey, thanks a lot for letting me uh, do my talk.